Before we get started on our topics for this episode, I wanted to give you a quick reminder about our upcoming episode guide to our first 50 episodes. The basic version will be out in August and an expanded version will follow later in the year. If you have signed up on our website, you'll get these automatically. If you haven't, sign up today. Go to www.montessoriforeverybody.com and give us our email address so we can give you the links and the other related information that will help you to make the best use of all of our episodes. Welcome to Montessori for Everybody TV. I'm Susan Zink. If you've read the title of this episode, I hope that you're curious and I hope that you haven't um, taken offense, but at least will give me time to explain what um, I feel like is a really important topic. So are you doing Montessori practice or a Montessori hobby? That is, is what we're going to talk about today. And I will say up front, they are not mutually exclusive by any stretch of the imagination. And I want you to understand that the reason that I'm talking about this is not some sort of, um, I know Montessori and this is Montessori and this isn't. And if you're not doing this, you're not doing Montessori. That's not what this is about at all. This is about, I have gotten lost in the Montessori hobby side of this and I have worked hard to do Montessori practice. And I have seen in my own experience, as well as in the experience of, of people that I know pretty well that I have taught with, and people that I know just a little bit from my interaction with them on the internet, that this can be a problem. It can be a problem that people get caught up in and it can derail what their real true intentions are for being involved with Montessori education. So let me talk about Montessori practice and the Montessori hobby. Let's start with the hobby. So the reason that I say, do you have a Montessori hobby is that there are a lot of things in Montessori education that encourage collecting, which is a hobby. And there are a lot of things that encourage crafting, crafting materials beautifully, which potentially is a hobby. These kinds of things are not bad. They're, they're not something that I'm telling you not to do. They are something that I am telling you can spiral out of control if you don't look at them carefully. And if they spiral out of control, they can hurt the other side of it, which to my mind is essential. If you want the benefits of Montessori education for the children you influence, you must do Montessori practice. Montessori hobby is optional. So let's talk about it a little bit so you can kind of see whether you see yourself in some of this. Um, I am one of those people who is a collector of books to the extreme. Um, it has been a problem in some ways and it has been a really, really enriching part of my life in another way. So if you're a collector of books for your classroom, I suggest that you figure out how to manage that appropriately. Are you running out of space for them? Are you finding that you have boxes of them somewhere that never see the shelves in your classroom? This means you may be a Montessori book hobbyist to your detriment. <laughs> Not that it's a bad thing, that it's telling you something needs to change. So this is one of those little, oh my gosh, if you see this at the the thrift store, you have to have it. It's real stuff. It's, it's um, a, a Montessori uh, person's dream. It's about real creatures. It's about baby animals. So the cute factor is just off the chart. It's little books. We like little things in Montessori. And guess what? It was $1.50. Yeah. So 
if you find something like this, you need to have some questions to ask yourself. One is, can the children in my classroom make good advantage of it? Is this something you would want to read aloud? It might be. It certainly has beautiful illustrations. The little factor is a, is a valid Montessori principle. Even children who are older, who are beyond any sensitive periods for small things, are sometimes drawn to small books, especially if they haven't been in a complete Montessori environment their whole life. If, if maybe their reading skills aren't as strong as anybody they happen to be comparing themselves to, then a small book may feel less threatening. So this for a dollar fifty, yes, <laughs> it would meet all of my requirements, except possibly if you already had it. And this is kind of a unique thing, so there's a good chance you would remember whether you had this sitting in a box, but not 100% necessarily. So, so make sure you have a list. If you're a Montessori hobbyist, you need a list so that you're making prioritized buys. For $1.50, I mean, even if this wasn't anywhere near the top of my list, more books for my zoology section, I still might get it and it still might be okay. But if you're not making those decisions consciously, you have a good chance that you're not serving yourself and your, your students. So, <laughs> How many of you are a fan of these collector's items? Um, these are the, the little animal figures. And what you see here is, is kind of a setup for a mammal exercise. So this is a collection of figures from a lot of different tubes. Most of you probably are familiar with those. If, if you've been looking at Montessori things online, some of these creatures are not from the tubes. They may be models that I had from, from other sources, but they are all mammals. And I would suggest this is a very worthwhile exercise. This is another, you know, gotta love those dollar stores, gotta love those dollar aisles, and for a dollar, oh my gosh, I know I need it, I know I'll do something with it. Can you relate? <laughs> so if you have your list, you're gonna make wiser choices even when you come across things like this. Because if you've seen my segment on the zoology section of the classroom, you know that's a place I've gone overboard. That's a place I have bought things that I already had. And it is an area where I feel like you need to be really careful. Now, that's not to say that when you see things like this, you shouldn't be in a position to make an informed snap decision. Things like this tend to get snapped up at the dollar stores or the dollar aisle. And if you've watched any of my segments on making or buying materials, you know that I am not a big fan of printing a lot of stuff out for color. This is a dollar. The whole set was a dollar. And so when you look at the quality of the illustrations, and one reason I'm showing you this one is, with in this age of Montessori printables, I believe we have too many photographs and not enough illustrations, high quality illustrations in the classroom. So as you start to refine your hobbyist tendencies, I think you can make it a strength. And that kind of brings up the hobbyist side of the crafting. If you're making materials, I would suggest going a little more in your crafting direction and a little bit away from your collecting um, hobby. When you make things by hand, when you hand color them, if you have the confidence to draw some of the things for the children, they are so interested in that and it draws them in and it's probably worth your while. Now, the other thing that I wanna say before I shift to the Montessori practice is, when we are Montessori hobbyists, sometimes we don't think clearly where we should focus those tendencies. If you want to be a Montessori hobbyist, I would say you can't go wrong with looking for good deals on real fossils, good deals on real rock specimens, soil specimens that you can bring into your classroom. Those are the kind of things that are gonna draw the children in, that are gonna educate them in a way that nothing else can, and will give you a chance to take your hobby into your practice. This is a fossil sand dollar. Can you imagine if you just had this on your 
dressing table or your desk at home or whatever and you just let it sit there and you've thought about how can I use this to draw the children into the timeline of life, into the study of um, echinoderms, into the study of the oceans. How can I do that in such a way that's going to, um, to make them be able to make the most of their time in the classroom. That's the way your hobby can help inform your practice. So Montessori practice, what is that? That is the things that you do on a regular basis to serve the children better, both when you're with them and when you're not. To my mind, Montessori practice has three main uh, branches to it. One is reflection. You cannot do valuable reflection without having first done valuable observation. There, there, is, there are actually studies that indicate that the amount of time an educator spends reflecting on his or her students when not in the classroom with them is an excellent indicator of how good an educator that person is. Does this mean I want you giving up your family time to think about your students? No, but it should be part of your practices. And that's the second leg of this. These are the habits and the routines that you do on a regular basis. Now, you may have habits around your classroom. You may have habits around acquiring materials for your students, but habits and and routines are things that cause you to get better and better and better at consciously interacting with your students. Focused goal setting for your own internal abilities, your own ways of interacting with the children, that has to be the main basis of your habits. So you're thinking about how do I need to change the way I speak with the children and how am I going to remind myself to change my habit so I'm speaking less or I'm speaking more softly. That's how you're going to change the tone in your classroom, how you're going to change how well you interact with those children in a real and meaningful way. And the last leg is strategic planning because if you are just buying whatever you happen to notice, making whatever material comes up free on your email uh, list or, or whatever, that's not going to cause you to make the best use of your time. Montessori is time intensive. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of energy. It's probably going to take a lot of space. And if you use strategic planning, you can make all those other pieces manageable. If you don't, it can consume you in a way that doesn't serve you, your children, or your family, if your children happen to be your students that aren't in your family. So I encourage you to look at how you can make sure that your Montessori hobby is not controlling you and that you are managing it and that you practice those three branches of your Montessori practice. Reflection, based on one of the the habits you need to have, which is regular observation and looking at any of those other habits that you need to develop and change to be most effective in the classroom. And then what runs all these different processes is your strategic planning. How do you lay out the way that you want to make changes in your classroom based on your reflections on your observations. How do you manage rotating all those things you've acquired through your Montessori hobby so that it's not a burden to you, but it's a joy for you and your students? Devote enough time to the Montessori practice and it can manage your Montessori hobby and make it a strength, make it a benefit to the students that get a chance to enjoy all those things that that you were drawn to to share with them in your Montessori classroom. Montessori practice is about the materials and the environment. Keep your Montessori materials in top condition. That should be one of your essential habits. If you've spent any time in a Montessori classroom at all, you know that the materials do need care. You'll find that paint chips, cards go missing, small objects definitely go missing, and there are several ways that we can approach this. One that we've covered in other episodes is teaching the children to care for the materials themselves and to teach them to handle them carefully. 
one of the things that does have to be done at some point is maintenance. And what I'm going to talk about is maintaining the materials in the classroom, and I'm actually going to show you some things that I keep in what I call my classroom first aid kit. This is not for children's um, medical emergencies. This is for mat materials emergencies. When their paint gets chipped, their pieces go missing, sometimes this will provide me what I can, can use to make things better. So it is actually a little kit that I take around when I'm doing consulting with different classrooms and, of course, that I kept in my classroom as well. So we're going to talk about some of the individual items that are useful to have. And one reason that it is nice to actually have a kit like this is so everyone who's involved with the classroom knows where to find the supplies that will help you to do the, the, the repair work that you need to do and that all those supplies are kept in one place so you always know where, where to find them. So one of the things that is important to do is to take advantage of anything that the manufacturer of the materials that you purchase does to, to um, work in your favor of keeping your materials in good shape. This may mean that they offer extra parts, it may mean that they offer a little kit of parts that typically go missing, such as the tiniest cube of the pink tower, um, sometimes even small states in a, a United States map, things like that. And one of the things that, that many manufacturers make available to you is touch-up paint. And this is just like the touch-up paint that they maybe give you at the body shop if you have repair. It's matched exactly to the materials, and you can then use it that to do repair work on your materials. Now, I'm not going to actually show you a material repair right now, but I am going to mention something about repairing the materials with paint. Typically, one of the best ways to do it is with a little bit of a dab action. So you dab a little bit of the paint on with a brush, and then you use your finger and have something nearby to clean your fingers off, maybe even some alcohol on a, a paper towel, so that you can dab the, the repair in. Usually paint brush strokes are not going to be what you're going for, and I will give you a caution. I may have a Sharpie in my kit, but it is not to use typically to touch up painted materials because the ink in, in the permanent markers, the Sharpie markers, will interfere with you doing proper repairs later on. Let's see what else we've got in our kit. Well, I always have a variety of different adhesives. Um, this is an adhesive, if you're into paper arts or scrapbooking, it's probably familiar to you. It's um, by the Tombow Company, and it's an adhesive that you can kind of roll on. So it's not a tape. It's not a two-sided tape. It's just adhesive that rolls down, and then you can press things in place. There is, There are some other adhesive glue dots that are very, very strong adhesive. All of these that I'm talking about are available at uh, Michael's uh, chain craft stores. Your local scrapbooking stores, if you have one, will also tend to have these. And, of course, you can probably order them online. But the glue dots are a very strong adhesive, so if you've got a, a piece that's come apart or something, you may be able to repair it with that. Um, Scotch Magic Tape is wonderful for any kind of paper repairs. I teach older children, and even some younger children, it kind of depends on their manual dexterity and their um, their level of attention to detail, uh, but I teach um, older children to repair book pages with the Scotch Magic Tape because that's it's used in libraries. It's very um, long-lasting, archival quality adhesives and and tape base. And so, if you've got torn pages, or even if the the body of the book has come loose from the binding in some books your Scotch Magic Tape is, is a good option there. Now, this is kind of the opposite of that. This is, uh, and actually these erasers, it's, I've heard it called a gum eraser. It, it's, um, it's got kind of a crepe um, feel to it. I've also heard it called crepe erasers, but that was a long time ago, so I'm not sure, sure what they're called now. But if you have dirt on, on some things, or if you have adhesive that's gotten where you don't want it to be when you're making materials, these are, this is really good for picking up gummy um, bits. This is just a regular little white eraser. The regular pink erasers are good for that as well. Now, 
Some of you probably won't know what this is, but if, if you're a little bit older, this is a nail file when, when people didn't tend to just polish nails and things, but they wanted a natural look, they would file their nails to, to a high polish. And sometimes if you've gotten the material that you've had to touch up and then you want to get it back to a higher shine, using nail materials can be useful. A very, very fine um, fingernail file and, and a buffer can be good. Now, <clears throat> this is a little bag of miniature objects. It's got things like a wig and a pod and a top and a fox and a dye and a hat. And it, it's not specifically to replace a certain material, but if you've all of a sudden had somebody who went home with a bunch of things in their pockets or something, sometimes it's, it can be nice to have just some miniature objects that you can, can replace quickly if a set has, has gotten diminished. Now, I do encourage you, if you are getting objects for your phonics materials in your classroom, that it would be appropriate to have extras and have replacements. Teach the children and the parents about this problem that of those very interesting little objects going missing, and do it in a way that's respectful of both the children and the, the setup in the classroom. Help them to understand, the children themselves, that if little objects go missing, the work is either not as nice or completely unusable, depending on the nature of the work. And talk to your pockets. Talk to your pockets. <laughs> talk to your parents about emptying pockets at the end of the day. This is one of the things that that I would say at the end of the first week of every school year. Remember to check pockets. I'd always at an orientation or an orientation letter briefly explain to the parents about these interesting little things that the children would like to have. So uh, a little reminder to check pockets and bring back to us anything you find will definitely help reduce that problem. Now let's see what else we've got here. Um, we have a, a knife for opening uh, uh, boxes and things like that, but one of the reasons is it's very sharp, and then when it gets not sharp, you can just snap the blade off with a, a pair of um, pliers, and so if you need to cut something fine, that's very nice to have. If there is something that you're pointing out to someone else in a book in the classroom, whether a child or when I'm doing consulting, if there's things in a book or a manual that that I show someone for a reference, then I'll use these little um, uh, post-it flags that are very durable. It's kind of like a permanent uh, bookmark for a book. Um, glue stick, of course, always a, a useful adhesive. If I do want to make notes on a, a handout that I am giving to someone, so let's say I'm doing a consultation and we're talking about classroom maintenance. I always will have a handout or things like that little touch tap technique for your paint. And if there's things I want to point out to them, then I always have a colored marker to do that. And then you, you may think I have a lot of attention on my nails. Well, that may be true, but it's not the reason that I have nail supplies in my first aid kit. This is, we used to be called an orange stick. I think they used to be made of orange wood long ago. But they're, they're used to push cuticles back. But if you have a botany cabinet and you still have children attempting to trace the botany with their fingers, that was the way I was taught a long time ago. But this is kind of the way that things have gone. So I always have a bunch of them in my kit so I can leave them with a teacher if, if they don't have one. Because it certainly is practical for a child to trace those little tiny leaf tips in the botany cabinet with an orange stick rather than with their fingers. Now I'm going to show you one more little repair piece. I think that's um, the main thing that I wanted to show you in here. These are um, uh, rings. They are actually called split rings. If you if you have a, a key ring, you probably have a larger version of these. And particularly, I, I don't know how else to say this, I, I do my best not to say things that are diminishing of anybody related in the Montessori industry, but I just have to say some of the bead chains that are, are being produced are not as high a quality as I would like them to be. And if they have um, a, a ring that's just shaped like this where it's a single piece of metal and there's an opening here, if that's what they have and that metal is not good quality, they will tend to come apart even with respectful use on the part of the children. And what I found is rather than trying to just keep replacing them, 
just going to a split ring for the weak places on those chains can be a good way to go. Now, you, you do kind of need some little jewelry things, or, or maybe even your orange stick would, would do it to open up the split ring and let you use that to, to fix the chains. And again, craft stores that have a jewelry department can take care of that for you. So I, I'm looking to see if there's anything else in here that I wanted to show you. Looks like there's just a couple of other pieces. Um, this is just a little card. A credit card um, works just fine. If you have bits and pieces that need to be scraped up, maybe it's um, some sticky that's gotten on something, using the, the edge of the card to be a scraping surface can be very, very helpful. So that's why I have that. And clear nail polish. Now again, you, you don't want to use this if you're then going to be going through with some nice clear spray, but if you do need to touch something up, um, clear nail polish can be very useful there. Extra rubber bands because rubber things, of course, will tend to deteriorate. And I think that's most of the things that I would suggest. Last thing, I have found these little clips, I think they're called banker's clips, but I'm, I'm not sure, are useful for all sorts of things. If you have a set of materials that you're not using rubber bands for, you might want to use those. If you have a child who's got sleeves that keep getting in her work and you want to pull those up and clip them out of the way, I've used them for that. So having a set of these in different sizes is useful. And a lot of times we have rings. We have work that is little booklets that are kept together with rings. So having some extra metal rings around in case one of those goes missing is very, very helpful. So in conclusion, if you're going to put together a classroom first aid kit, have a little pad or a little piece of paper that you keep either in your master notebook or actually with the kit. So when you notice the need for things to repair stuff in the classroom, maybe there's something, maybe you have a map and for some reason one piece always goes missing. The next time you order that piece, if you're fortunate enough to have materials that are from a manufacturer where you can order replacement pieces, order two and then put one in your first aid kit and, and replace the one that's missing in the classroom. Um, I encourage you to keep those materials in the best repair that you can so that the shelves and the materials are as attractive as possible. When your goal is to attract the children into work that's going to help them to concentrate well, you need to keep things looking as beautiful as you can.